All right, welcome to another episode of Tech Tuesdays. I am your host, Sir Cal, with the Geek Source Entertainment Podcast. Uh, so yeah, uh, this episode uh, is going to be interesting um, for a couple of reasons. So um, let's get into it, shall we? Let me bring up my notes. All right. So, first story, follow-up from about two weeks ago, where we talked about the issue where it was discovered that through uh, a few simple a few simple tips or tricks, you could listen in on someone through FaceTime, a group FaceTime session without their consent. Uh, well, Apple has since uh, updated... Uh, updated iOS with the latest iOS update of 12.1.4 and that fixes the issue. Uh, Group FaceTime is now back uh, and this issue no longer happens. Uh, And the teenager, the 14 year old Grant Thompson who discovered the bug has been rewarded. Uh, Interesting story um, reading from the Washington Post. He stumbled upon this issue uh, when he was playing the video game Fortnite. Uh, when his friend did not pick up the FaceTime call, he added a second friend to the group call, which caused the original call to pick up even though his friend did not answer. Uh, he recreated the hack several times with his friends and his mom to confirm the, the existence of the bug, he said. And now Apple is rewarding him for his discovery. The company said it would pay uh, the Thompson family for reporting the bug and will also make a gift toward Grant's education. Apple did not say, though, how much it would give. Uh, so this is cool. Just generally um, pretty cool of Apple to actually reward uh, this kid. Um, it is really funny that he discovered it while playing Fortnite. Like, yeah, just... um never would have guessed and then um yeah that's um that overall good news so if you have an iphone or ipad update to uh ios 12.1.4 check your uh settings uh and if you have uh, a mac that can run the latest uh update Uh, also check for a software update on your Mac because they, uh, released a update to Mac OS for this exact reason as well, uh, to fix the, the, uh, group FaceTime bug. Now, it is funny because there were threats of legal action against Apple for lack of security. However, just recently there was an article uh, from AppleInsider.com that talks about how someone is now suing Apple for too much security. (sighs) Apple is being sued because two-factor authentication takes too much time. The suit filed by Jay Brodsky in California alleges that Apple doesn't get user consent to enable two-factor authentication. Furthermore, once enabled, two-factor authentication imposes an extraneous logging in procedure that requires a user to both remember their password and have access to a trusted device or trusted phone number when a device is enabled. Uh, the suit continues. First, plaintiff has to enter his selected password on the device he is interested in logging in. Then he has to enter the password on another trusted device to log in. And then third, optionally, plaintiff has to select a trust or don't trust pop-up message response. Fourth, plaintiff then has to wait to receive a six-digit verification code on that second device that is sent by an Apple server on the internet. Finally, plaintiff has to input the the received six-digit verification code on the first device he is trying to log into. Each login process takes an an additional estimated two to five or more minutes with two-factor authentication. Okay, and um, as someone who has multiple Apple devices, has two-factor authentication turned on on all of them, um, because it kind of, yes, it turns on with, um, your iCloud account. Like once you turn it on on one device, it's on for all of them, I think is how that works because it's not a device security. It's an iCloud security thing. Um, as someone who, who has two factor authentication, um, this is bull crap. This does not take that long. It does not take two to five minutes. 
every single time. Um, in fact, Apple Insider themselves says this. They have not been randomly presented with any two-factor authentications on Saturday, even following uh, OS updates to an iPhone XS Max, iPhone X, and two 6th Gen iPads, but was able to force the issue on a new device. Basically, they couldn't get the two-factor authentication thing to you know pop up. It is an optional thing that you have to sign up for. Maybe there was a bug in that and it got turned on and this person didn't uh, intend for it to turn on. Or it could just be that this person's an idiot who didn't realize what he was getting into when he said, yes, turn two-factor authentication on. Um, and Apple Insider, nonetheless, when they got the issue to come up, when they got a request for two-factor authentication, the process took 22 seconds to accomplish. Yeah, see? Not very long! It's, like, super simple. Okay, this is just so stupid. Oh, man. And see, as someone who's worked in... Um, in the tech world, I was I was a uh, representative or salesperson at a uh, at a phone store. Um, these kind of people um, infuriate me because they don't understand how things work, and then they blow things up out of proportion to make the smallest issue sound like the biggest thing ever. The thing is, is I can see two factor authentication being an issue where, say, you're logging into a new device and you don't have your phone on you, um, or something like that. Um, but even then it's not a huge deal. They just don't let you sign in for a period. And even then, you know, you can, I think, talk to Apple support about reversing the issue or something like that. Like I, I've never run into it. The only time I've ever seen someone have an issue, um, where I can, or where I can imagine someone having an issue is this, is if say they only have maybe two devices, they have maybe an iPad, and a phone, and they lose their phone, they have to get a new phone, they didn't bring their iPad with them, you know, um, I just, I can't, you know, and even then, it's such a, like, yeah, just, uh, I don't know, I don't know, that's, that's not even the point of the suit, the suit isn't, oh, that it makes logging in on other devices harder, um, for someone who may be in a predicament where they don't have access to their devices, that is mentioned, but the biggest focus on this is that it takes too long. When it doesn't even take that long. Jeez. Okay, moving on. Apple is looking to make their own cellular chips, according to uh, uh, Mac Rumors article, uh, with a team led by Johnny Saruji. If I'm saying his name right, Apple is expected to release its first 5G-enabled iPhone in 2020, but it's unclear if it will have an in-house chip ready by that time. If not, a previous report said e Intel will supply Apple with 5G chips, but the iPhone maker is said to be unhappy with Intel's progress and may have to look elsewhere. So basically, there's Apple is looking to make their own cellular chips in-house because Intel uh, has not been up to snuff. And so, yeah, um, they may, they, they're going to start work on that. They may not get their own out in time, may have to stick with Intel uh, for a bit, but, or they may have to look elsewhere. This is one of the reasons why I'm glad I don't have an iPhone XS or because, and why I'm glad I have an iPhone X because the iPhone XS and XS Max and XR all use Intel modems and they're all inferior compared to even phones that have modems from like three, four years ago. Um, you know, it's kind of a luck of the draw. There are some people that have iPhone XSs and XS Maxes that have no problems. And then there are other people that have never, that have been through like three, four returns and can't get decent service on their phones. This is across all carriers because it's the same modem in both. Whereas before, you know, the standard version of the iPhone was the Qualcomm version, um, and not the Intel. And the Intel version was only sold on like Sprint and T-Mobile or something like that, or maybe it was AT&T and T-Mobile, whereas Verizon and Sprint, one, you know, two of them would get the Intel, two of them would get uh, the Qualcomm, and then the unlocked version that would be made available after a month or two was the Qualcomm edition. So, yeah, um, the standard version of, of, 
um, iPhones were the Qualcomm's, and now that they're all Intel, this issue is much more blown, overblown. I and this issue has existed. I remember hearing reports of people that got Intel modems with their iPhone 10s, and reception was not nearly as good as it was on the Qualcomm's. But nonetheless, it's uh, yeah, still just yeah. I'm glad I don't have a 10s. <laughs> Now, in actual big news, like actual real big Apple news, um, their retail chief, Angela Arendt, Arendt, I don't know how to say her name, uh, is departing in April. Deirdre O'Brien is taking over. The last five years have been the most stimulating and challenging and fulfilling of my career, Arendt herself stated, though the team... Through the team's collective efforts, retail has never been stronger or better positioned to make an even greater contribution for Apple. And then Tim Cook said, At Apple, we believe our soul is our people, and Deirdre understands the qualities and strengths of our team better than anyone. And so, yeah. Um, and Deirdre O'Brien is so is going to, is their current head of people, like HR, I guess, and is going to be taking over retail, head of retail as well. So she's taking over head of retail and people is I think what her official position um, title is. So this will be interesting. Um, I know Angela Arendt has been a, um, um, maybe it's Arendt, I don't know. But she's been a controversial figure. Some people really liking what she's done. Other people's not liking what she's done. Some people have said that the Apple Store experience is downgraded and become worse off with her in charge. Um, other people saying that it's um, had a lot of benefits. Um, she's only been with Apple since 2014, right around the time that they promoted, started promoting the Apple Watch. And their focus was with her to try to make Apple more fashion-oriented. Um, but yeah, it just, it looks like it didn't work out for whatever reason. We don't get in a huge reason as to why it's not working out. Um, like an official reason. I think one of the reasons was listed that she wanted to spend more time with her family. Um, but even still, it's just, it's one of those things of like, hmm, this will be an interesting shake up and it'll, and we'll, it'll be curious to see where this takes Apple's store experience. Um, in the future, because I know a lot of the things that changed um, about the Apple Store uh, were because of Angela, and some people liked them, some people didn't. Uh, one of the things I did like um, that she implemented, or at least put more focus on, was some of the training um, exercises where you could go into an Apple Store and actually take training courses on your devices. I think that's something that more companies should do, actual sit-down groups where you can sit down with a person and actually learn how to do things on your devices. It's not a perfect system, um, but it's still really cool that they do that. And there are other things that they do. Um, but there were other things about the way they, the Apple stores changed design and changed their focus that ticked a lot of people off as well. So, yeah. Um, overall, it seems like the reaction to her leaving was more positive than negative. Um, so that may say something. Uh, so yeah, I guess we'll see where, um, where this goes. And in more security news, there was the report that certain apps have been found to secretly record your usage of said apps. Um, and this was a report by TechCrunch. Apps like Abercrombie... Amber Crombie and Fitch, Hotels.com, Singapore Airlines, and other um, and other apps used a service called Glassbox, a customer experience analytics firm, one of a handful of companies that allows developers to embed st- session replay technology into their apps. These session replays let app developers record the screen and play them back to see how its users interacted with the app to figure out if something didn't work or if there was an error. Every tap, button push, and keyboard entry is recorded, effectively screenshotted, and sent back to the app developers. The app analyst, a mobile expert, 
who writes about his analysis of popular apps on his uh, on his blog, recently found Air Canada's iPhone app was not properly masking the session replays when they were sent, exposing passport numbers and credit card data in each replay session. Just weeks earlier, Air Canada said its app had a data breach, exposing 20,000 profiles. Now, not every app was leaking masked data. None of the apps we examined said that they were recording a user's screen, let alone sending them back to each company or directly to Glassbox's cloud. And of course, now Apple is telling app developers to remove or properly disclose their use of analytics code that allows them to record how a user interacts with their iPhone apps or face removal from the App Store. TechCrunch can confirm. In an email, an Apple spokesperson said protecting user privacy is paramount in the Apple ecosystem. Our App Store review guidelines require that apps request explicit user consent and provide a clear visual indication when recording, logging, or otherwise making a record of user activity. We have notified the developers that are in violation of these strict privacy terms and guidelines and will take immediate action if necessary, the spokesperson added. And in one case, Apple gave the developer less than a day to remove the code and resubmit their app or the app would be removed from the App Store, the email said. So, yeah, this is uh, pretty big news. I mean, like, there is some argument as to why, like, to be clear, these were only in app screen recordings. Those apps that were using the screen recording thing were only doing it within your app. They were not, they were not recording your entire phone or how you use the rest of your phone. But it's still concerning because they never disclose this information. That's concern number one. And then it's concern number two is when apps like, you know, airline apps and shopping apps where you're buying things, you're putting in confidential information, your name, your, uh, your credit card, your passport info, that sort of thing, they're not properly cloaking that, causing issues where, you know, if these things were hacked, in fact, I think in this article, they actually showed how, where they saw, they, they analyzed the things that, um... TechCrunch was able to work with another company to see what these apps were recording and sending back, and they were not, that you could see things, you could, add, like, there was a screenshot, it was just like, oh my gosh, this is scary, like, to, and of course, you know, this information is exposed then if they have a data breach, like Airline Canada or whatever, and so, yeah, it's the, the biggest problem is that they weren't cloaking, not only is it creepy, but they're, they're, they weren't properly cloaking secure information, and then they weren't notifying users that they were doing that, they were, there was no, in these apps, there was no record, no statement in their security policy that this was happening, um, which violates Apple's guidelines, and that's why they're saying, um, yeah, you just show us what you're what you're actually doing, or get off the App Store. Um, so yeah, <sighs> fun week for Apple, I swear. Especially a lot regarding policy. I mean, they're getting they're they they're getting sued for being too secure, um, and then they got hit two weeks ago for not being secure enough with FaceTime, and then now they have apps that are, you know, apps that are recording you when you use them, and this just comes after where they where they went after Google and Facebook for circumventing the App Store, giving away apps that used the developer certificate in order to, you know, steal data from, or, you know, monitor data from iPhone users there, and it's just like, oh my word, Ah, <laughs> it seems like a lot of stuff going on with security in Apple right now. Now, shifting focus from Amazon or from Apple to Amazon. Um, obviously, there is the news that uh, apparently the National Enquirer has uh, Jeff Bezos nudes and uh, tried to uh, blackmail him. Um, we will. S you can read about that. I don't feel like going into that story. That's weird um and yeah there's a lot of legal implications with that and it's not a story that i can't yeah i'm not getting into that um but in another less um less compromising uh news for amazon um the washington report the washington post reports that amazon may be reconsidering their new york uh their new york site um due to opposition 
hailed as an economic triumph when it was announced by Governor Andrew Cuomo and Mayor Bill de Blasio. The project now faces withering criticism from some elected officials and advocacy groups appalled at the prospect of giving giant subsidies to the world's most valuable company. In the past two weeks, the state Senate nominated an outspoken Amazon critic to a state board where he could potentially veto the bill, and city council members for the second time aggressively challenged company executives at a hearing where activists booed and unfurled anti-Amazon banners. Key officials, including freshman U.S. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I hope I'm saying her name right, whose district border... Uh, whose district borders the proposed Amazon site have all railed against the project. No specific plans to abandon New York have been made, and it is possible that Amazon would try to use a threat to withdraw to put pressure on New York officials, but company executives have had internal discussions recently to reassess the situation in New York and explore alternatives, said two people who spoke on the condition of anonymity. The company has not leased or purchased office space for the project in the Queens neighborhood of Long Island City, making it easy to abandon the commitment. And this is compared to Virginia, where unlike in Virginia, elected officials quickly passed an incentive package for a separate headquarters campus and Tennessee, which has embraced plans for a smaller facility. Final approval from New York State is not expected until 2020. It's unclear what Amazon might consider as a plan B if the New York project falls through. It could forego the incentive package and hire employees on a smaller scale as competitors, including Google, are doing. Or Amazon could just search for another jurisdiction to get some or all of the jobs. So this is um, – this is – so the situation here is, is that Amazon, you know – it announces that they're going to be uh, building a new New York office um, and people are criticizing it that they're getting subsidies and benefits from, you know, from th- this area. I don't know if it's the state or the city that handles this stuff, but, um, you know, they're they're appalled that they're giving benefits and subsidies to Amazon, especially since Amazon is such a huge company. You know, why shouldn't they you know, pay what everyone else should pay in taxes and stuff like that. And, you know, they have some opposition in the Senate and all that. Uh, and since they have not even uh, laid grounds or, you know, made plans for an office yet, and it hasn't even, it's not even expected to pass until 2020 compared to other states where it went through quickly. Um, this does look like possible doom for the New York um food for this new york office i'm i honestly i can see where critics of amazon are coming from um because you look at a company i think it was foxconn that pulled some of the same things where they were like oh yeah we'll build a shop here and we'll we'll get so many jobs and then it was recently reported that oh yeah um they're gonna be hiring like way less than they said they would they're getting all these benefits from the the local government and then they're not even hiring the amount of people that they promised so it's like they're getting all these benefits and then they're not they're not giving away jobs you know they're not getting so you know on one hand that's kind of the the benefits of why we would give subs you know why you would give benefits and subsidies and stuff like that to company like amazon as well yes sure they're a huge company but uh you know if we give the incentive to to build here, they'll give us jobs, and that doesn't always seem to be the case. Sometimes they they take their benefits and then they don't follow through on their end of the deal. You know, they don't hire people. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this plays through. Um, and you know, it's always good to be skeptical of big companies. Uh, but I'm hoping for the best. I'm hoping we're at it wherever Amazon goes that, you know, if they promise to hire so many amount of people that they'll actually hire so many amount of people and that you know people will get jobs. Um, but, yeah, this is just a very interesting situation. We'll see how it goes. And then finally, save the best story for last. Uh, this episode um, is – this story is the most relevant to me because I'm on this platform, and that is Anchor got acquired by Spotify. In a statement on Medium.com, their co-founders Michael Magano, Mag, Mag, Nano, 
Magnano, I don't know how to say his last name, and Nur Zickerman share their perspective in that in 2014, the two of us became obsessed with podcasts inspired by now classics like Serial, The Grantland Network, Gimlin's Gimlet Startup, Don Carlin's Hardcore History, and countless others, we tried to start podcasts of our own, only to become discouraged by the complicated process and expensive hardware we found ourselves endlessly researching. We quickly realized we weren't alone, and so we set out to create a better way to make podcasts. With a mobile-first approach, a willingness to quickly iterate, and an ability to move and fail fast, we embarked on building the future." And then moving on to with the discussion of Spotify, they say, when we first discussed joining forces, Daniel Eck, Spotify's founder and CEO, told us that Spotify wanted to give Anchor superpowers. Most importantly, we came to the conclusion that our two companies' missions are perfectly aligned. As Daniel and Spotify's chief research and development officer, Gustav Soderstrom expressed to us, Spotify's mission is to unlock the potential of human creativity by giving a million creative artists the opportunity to live off their art and billions of fans the opportunity to enjoy and be inspired by it. It was at that moment we realized Spotify is the perfect home for Anchor. And they go on to say that, you know, if you're already using Anchor, nothing will change. You know, they're still going to distribute in the same way. So, you know, there is some concern about, well, wait, if you're joining Spotify, does that mean our our podcasts are not going to be hosted on, say, Apple or other platforms? You know, and there is that concern of that. Maybe there will be podcasts that become Spotify only or anything like that. Um, You know, I guess we'll see. Um... We'll see what this partnership becomes. I'm cautiously optimistic because part of me is like, oh, great. It's going to become a package with Spotify. The other thing I'm most worried about is reviewing music is, you know, I don't make monetization off my podcast because of the fact that, you know, I have music on it and I care about having music on it. I like having music on my platform. Um, And so I don't get paid for it uh because you can't like there's you know laws and stuff and legal requirements that you can't have music on the platforms um that you uh that if you can have sponsorships and monetization so which i totally get but i so i choose to go the route of you know i like music more than i do necessarily getting you know like a dollar or two from making a podcast so i keep the music on maybe when i become big enough and i'm making money from the people that listen to my podcasts or something, I might do it, um, but nonetheless, I mean, it's like, you know, there, I actually listened to an episode, uh, by, uh, Dewan and Only, I think someone, uh, if you're gonna listen to anyone, I think his perspective on it is pretty good, because, you know, when you look at apps that get acquired by their companies, typically, you know, the reason why those apps get acquired is that they get acquired because the bigger company sees that the smaller company is is doing something good. And he points to Instagram. Facebook owns Instagram, and yet Instagram doesn't feel anything like Facebook. And, you know, you're not forced to use Facebook to use Instagram or anything like that. So some people like him are pretty optimistic about the future. Um, some people are a bit more negative. Um, I, I'm more on the middle ground. Like, I can totally see where both are coming from. Um and yeah, I think I think this could be very exciting so long as Spotify, you know, doesn't restrict things. So, you know, um, that's my perspective on that. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely like the I, I think if they keep that core thing of, you know, we make we want to make it easier for podcasts to become a thing. Um, I think that could be great, especially with added boosts from Spotify. Spotify now has all this extra data and money that they can pour into, uh, pour into Spotify. And yeah, I think this could be overall a a pretty good thing. So let me know what, uh, you think of all these stories below in the comments on YouTube. Give me a call in on anchor. I, you know, wouldn't mind having one of those. Um, you know, Uh, Be sure to favorite me on Anchor, subscribe on YouTube, give this video a like, Um, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, Uh, I am uh, Geek Source Official on both, and yeah, Um, I will see you next time. Have a great Tuesday and a great rest of your week. 
Holy shoot. Probably the longest episode I've ever done.